Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of RackN, and this is a digital rebar training video specifically for first-time users, welcome, uh, who want to get started in the cloud. We're going to be using Amazon as our cloud infrastructure here, so you will need an Amazon account and credentials to access the API to get this running. It's a very fast video. It takes very little effort to install Digital Rebar in Amazon and then connect to Amazon resources using our built-in cluster and resource broker pattern. And we're going to walk you through all of that and show you how the product works too. The best place to start is from portal.rackn.io. And from there, you'll see that we have a quick link to the Getting Started documentation, as well as a, a link that you can use to connect to the installer and then ultimately your Digital Rebar instance. I'll show you how all those things work. This is the quick start guide that rides you through generally how to get running. For this uh, tutorial, we're going to use the cloud and VM install because it has specific details for how you run in a cloud, including what ports you need to open, and then this getting started script that we'll need when we actually build our resource in Amazon. So I'm going to capture that into the clipboard right away. Over on my Amazon infrastructure, I'm going to go ahead and build a new demo instance. You can see I've already gone through one rehearsal with demo one. Hopefully demo two will be much better. And we will go ahead and use Amazon Linux. We test on a variety of Linuxes. Uh, Amazon is perfectly fine and free here. And for size, for a quick test, I can just use a one gig of RAM system. And Digital Rebar is incredibly lightweight and efficient, even for a system that can handle tens of thousands of machines, obviously not with one gig of RAM. So if you plan to do a lot of testing or some stress, use a bigger instance. For my instance details, most of these defaults are great. But one thing I want to be able to do is, is use that startup script. So the advantage of using my startup script is I don't have to do any additional interactions. It's going to grab my IP address. And you can see we have some different cloud defaults if you were using a cloud besides Amazon. I'm going to remove those here. And then we're just going to uh, run our install script. That's going to tell it to do an install using the universal pattern, which does a whole bunch of background installs and cloud infrastructure pieces automatically uh, loaded and prepped for us. We're going to use the TIP version. TIP means the latest code. It's reliable in most cases. Um, we keep it very easy to use. Stable is our last release uh, and also often a good choice depending on what you want to try and get done. And then we're going to set the IP address. Storage is great. We do want to add a name to the system called demo2 and then move into our security group. For security, this is the place where you're going to have to pay attention to your configuration. I already have some set up and what you'll notice here is that they set up 8090, uh, 8090, 8091 and 8092 as my inbound ports. Uh, you need at least 8092 to make this work. Uh, you can secure the other ports behind your VPC. Uh, that's a more advanced configuration. So for this getting started video, I'm going to recommend that you just open those ports uh, and get things running from that perspective. We're almost done doing our review. All this looks great. I'm going to go ahead and I don't actually need to log into the box. So I'm going to uh, use Greg's key here. And now things are running just fine. If I jump over into viewing instances, what you'll see is that we have our infrastructure here running and this demo2 instance is the one I want to use. It's going to take just a couple of moments to bring up. It might already be, be available for me. So I'm going to grab its public IP address, jump back to where I have the portal and put that IP address in right over here. I'm going to add in 8092 for the port. And what you'll see is I've immediately jumped to my login screen. That's great. Uh, I have to, because the system is using self-signed certificates, I need to allow um, the self-signed certificate to be installed. Perfect timing here. The system literally just came up and made itself available, so I can go ahead and accept that self-signed certificate. Looks good. And it's going to bring me back to the same login screen. So let me close that, go back to here. For my first login, I'm going to need to validate uh, my credentials. So here, if you this is your first time, it's Rocket Skates is our default user with R-O-C-K-8-T-S in the password. So let me type that in here. C-K R-0-C-K-E-T-S-K-A-T-S. I'm going to log in with that uh, password. That looks really good. 
Now, before I can start using Digital Rebar, I do need to create a license. Digital Rebar is licensed software. We're not a SaaS, so you're not uploading or giving us credentials um, or setting up your secrets with us. Uh, you are running the software, but license allows you to do that. And we're not going to ask you for credit card or money um, or even start putting you on our email lists unless you ask us to do that. So you would fill out that information. I've already gone through this process once and have a license, so I can just pick up my license from the system and reload it. Uh, this is normal if you're doing multiple demos. The recommended process is to download your license and keep uploading that same license. We'll show you what that process looks like. And that takes me directly into the system bootstrapping screen uh, where I, it's going to walk me through the process that we need to get started. Before I do that, uh, the system's already identified that, that, that this license is not valid. Um, and we're going to go ahead and check on what's happening says that this endpoint that I just created isn't registered in license, that's normal. And I can click here and update and run that license. This is exactly what would happen if you'd done one demo, tore it all down, built a whole new endpoint, took that same license and put it back in the system, you would follow these exact steps. That's why I want to walk you through that process. And the download button is where you would go to retrieve that license and continue to use it. So from here, our wizard is going to show us exactly the steps that we need to go in to get things going. And it's telling us we should change our default password. Always a good idea, uh, which I'm going to go ahead and set up my new password. Make that happen really quickly. Excellent. So now that I've done that, looks like it's all happy. I can go back into this wizard and you'll see that that checkbox has been done. Now, there are some steps in this wizard uh, that are already done. That's what the universal install flag does. And then also ones that we don't have to worry about. If I was doing a bare metal install or an on-premises install where I want to pixie boot things, I would need to install additional steps, uh, additional components to make that happen. For cloud, we don't need to do that. And we're going to be able to just jump forward all the way down through the system. One thing I do recommend you do is take a moment to add your SSH keys. It's very easy to do here. You can either just paste them in, or if you have some, you can just uh, drag them in. And let's see, I think I have them right here. It looks great. And submit them into the system. Uh, this is a very uh, convenient piece because when we provision equipment, we're going to always go through and add in whatever SSH keys we have registered in the system, uh, regardless of what type of infrastructure it is. So always useful to upload your SSH keys and, and get that going. Now, the next thing that we're going to do here is we're going to need to start installing some resource brokers for Amazon. Before I do that, I actually want to go and, and prove that the base system is working. Uh, and with that, you'll see we have some resource brokers, some the context broker and the pool broker. Context broker builds machines and containers, and I can literally just come in and build a test cluster using that context broker over here. Things are very easy create three machines. So I'm going to use my default cluster pipeline. I'm going to use my uh, runner context to just run that, that cluster pipeline, and then use the context broker to go ahead and build the infrastructure. I'll tell you about more of these features as we go. Right now, we're just testing to see that everything works and so that I can show you some of the basics on how the system is operated. Now, if I look over here, you'll see I'm, I'm literally running this pipeline as I build the cluster. Uh, that process is talking to the, uh, cl the context broker behind the scenes and should have created, excellent, the different machines that I need to make this run. And if I scroll things over a little bit, you will see uh, those processes have come up and those machines have been built. This first machine here is what we call the self-runner. That machine is the digital rebar endpoints machine, and it's used to bootstrap and do the install processes. So if we were to look at, at that machine's op history, we would actually see all of the provision, initial provisioning and setup operations. So this looks good. We've built that one cluster uh, just to test the system and make sure everything looks good. But what we really want to do here is build a Amazon infrastructure to connect to. And to do that, I need to build an Amazon resource broker. So I'm going to use a uh, template. We have templates for a lot of these. You're, uh, we have videos that show you how to build your own resource uh, profiles here for your own brokers. In this case, I can just leverage the one that AWS already has. I'm going to let it be called AWS Broker. It's going to use Terraform behind the scenes. All that's pre-wired. Excellent. And the pipeline for that is our broker-based pipeline. So it's possible to build pipelines and then extend them in some really interesting ways. 
And for this pipeline to work, you'll see I have two required items, my secret key and my access key. So let me get those pasted in from off screen. There we go. I've got my two values. Obviously, I don't want to show them. They are my secret keys. Um, and because we're not a SAS, these are not going to be known by RackN when you put them into your system. They're in your own database, in your own uh, components. And then I have a whole bunch of optional parameters for this resource broker that will determine its behavior. All of this is overridable on a per cluster um, or per request basis, but the defaults allow me to sort of just get running with keeping everything easy. If I click in, you'll see what the defaults are set to. Uh, like I said, US West is a great default for this because our uh, AMIs are based out of US West AMIs. And the same thing is true. I can choose my different instance types, security groups, firewall ports, uh, RSA user keys. Uh, in this case, I need this to be um, for Amazon. Actually, I don't want to define this. This will get defined by my AWS broker. So I'm going to leave that undefined. And let's give it an interesting color and give it an icon that we can recognize for Amazon. That looks good. Hit save. So now what I've done is I've built this Amazon resource broker. Now I call this the Amazon resource broker. I could have called it and you can see it's going through and automatically provisioning and going through a process in the background. I could have called this anything, red, green, blue, US West, uh, team six, it doesn't matter. Amazon, the brokers are not specific to a cloud, they're specific to the credentials or configuration sets that you have. So if I have different credentials or different teams or different defaults, I can create additional brokers for it. This is just our first broker. Uh, my next broker would be called, you know, uh, US East or something like that and make, makes, allows me to get things running. For simplicity, I'm gonna use the default name here. And now, that I've created that broker. Let's check in on our wizard. Uh, our wizard is uh, pretty excited because it says that we've already created a cluster and that we have uh, resource pools going entirely right here. That's good. That's that test cluster. Let's create another cluster. We're going to call this one uh, demo. Uh, let's see. We're going to call it demo two. Uh, that'll work out just fine and how things get shown. Uh, um, we need these names are going to translate into Amazon. So I want to make sure we get them right. We're going to use the base pipeline. So the cluster pipeline here determines all the operations. If I was building a Kubernetes cluster or an uh, app cluster or something, I could build my own pipeline. We have videos explaining how to do that. That would build you something besides just uh, generic infrastructure. Once again, all that's going to run in DRP CLI. I don't need specialized tools for that. And I'm going to use this base cluster pipeline profile here. Instead of choosing context, I'm going to go ahead and choose the AWS broker and I'm going to set it up. We'll go ahead and start it with three machines. That seems great. And I can even set my icon here. Um, if I want to have specialized icons for uh, my cloud infrastructure. Uh, this looks good. We're going to give this one purple instead of pink, and we will also call this one Amazon. Looks good. All right. So now as it's going through the process, I said go, it's starting the process to build the cluster. This is the clusters pipeline. So you'll see here, it's been running all by itself. It got to a point where it said, now we need to go ahead and build the resources, get, get the cluster going. So it's talking to the broker. Let's check in on the broker. You'll see over here, here's our Amazon broker. It's doing work. So we can see that very clearly. This is the, the item. I can keep drilling down in here and see this is all of the process that's running for it. And at this point, it's just running Terraform. So it has gone through the process of actually um, building a Terraform plan based on the templates that are already provided in Digital Rebar. We have videos explaining how to do that. These work out of the box and they're driven by those configuration uh, parameters that I've put into the system. Now, what Digital Rebar does here is it's actually going through and letting Terraform create the machines. Let's refresh and see how, see how we're doing. Here's all of our new uh, demo to cluster machines appropriately named. And the other thing that happens is as those machines are created by Terraform, digital rebar will create the machines in digital rebar even before they've checked in in Amazon. So the machines are being created in Amazon. They're also created beforehand in digital rebar and assigned the pipeline that we asked for. 
The reason that's important is that when those machines come on, they're going to automatically connect into Digital Rebar and then start doing the pipeline, the workflows that are assigned to the machine. And that can be driven per machine, per cluster, um, in, in all sorts of ways. And that allows us to know exactly which operations are going to be started and continued throughout the life cycle of that machine, even before the machine has been created. So we have a lot of control in how that cluster gets built. And in just a minute, you'll actually see it here. We've started them. Those machines are coming online, connecting in, and then being driven through a standard process. This process is the same on every cloud. It's the same on bare metal. It's the same on on-premises VMs. It does things like, in this case, install Linux packages, set my SSH keys, do conformance checks and validation, security profiling, uh, and it can even be set, easily be set to extend and run whatever install steps you want for your machine, whether they're Ansible, Bash, uh, PowerShell. Uh, the system is, is multilingual from that perspective, and you can include whichever steps make sense to you in building and extending these pipelines. And we have videos showing you exactly how to do those, those operations. So at this point, if I jump back to Amazon, all of these machines are running. That looks great and our system is operational waiting for those final machines to come online. Our cluster is now in a wait for those clusters to finish. That is also a configurable setting. Uh, one of the things I can do here is actually go back and resize that cluster. So if I said, you know, I really needed five machines for that cluster, super easy to do it. I can just come in and then rerun this blueprint. This is a day two operations cluster resizing operation and that will kick off a new activity without rerunning the entire cluster workflow, but it's going to go evaluate the cluster size and say that it needs to do additional work. Back in, in our resource brokers, you'll see we've gone back to the Amazon resource broker. We're running a new uh, Terraform, and in this case, it knows it only has to create those two additional machines. If I come back into Amazon and refresh, you will see that, let's see if I can get this out of the way, you'll see that we've actually built up these additional two, these additional new machines that are going through that process. The advantage here is that now I have an API at the cluster level to make decisions. I can size, change, resize, and manipulate the cluster at the cluster level, tell it to reevaluate its values, and then know that the right things will happen. As those machines come on, they will be provisioned. If I wanted to, I can deprovision systems and have the correct operations happen as part of deprovisioning. This is the core essence of how Digital Rebar handles building operations, but also running operations. You can hook this, and we have videos showing it, to a GitOps workflow or other event systems that allow you, like a CICD, that allow you to uh, do this type of work when necessary. Now, one of the things I can also do is set the cluster to zero, and that would take all resources out of the cluster. Another interesting thing that I can do, if I switch back into workflow mode, I can remove the cluster. And here we're gonna, I'm gonna remove the cl test cluster. And this is a cleanup operation, it's not a delete. So as part of this operation, it will deprovision the machines. It's literally running a Terraform, what would be a Terraform destroy, taking those machines out of the system and making things go. And we have some dev process workflows that actually would do that on a nightly basis or on a timer so that you could have the infrastructure automatically sweep and clean up. And we're gonna do just the same thing with Amazon, with these Amazon machines in a moment and allow us to uh, show how the clusters get deleted and cleaned up. Just need to wait for uh, the system to actually finish doing the provisioning before I do the cleanup. So now that these uh, systems are cleaned up, let's go ahead and remove the cluster. Actually, before I do that, I do want to show you a troubleshooting tip that's really handy. Um, we're using Terraform here, and you'll notice in the process that we store the Terraform state file, here it is, uh, as part of the cluster that allows us to have each cluster having its own Terraform state file and all this is visible to you. But sometimes people want to know the plans that are being generated. Digital Rebar does not store the plans. Those are dynamically generated every time uh, and for security reasons they have sensitive information we don't want to store the plan. However, uh, for troubleshooting, it can be very handy to store a plan and do uh, diagnostics and troubleshooting. And if you want to see the plans that are generated by your system, what you can do is go into the broker. This is a broker setting. So I'm going to go ahead and unlock that object. It keeps 
people from accidentally uh, changing it. And I just have to add a param called terraform uh, debug plan. So when I have that, and you'll see there's some help that tells you all about it, including a scary warning, set this to true. And now when I run my plans uh, through the broker next time, what would happen is the cluster would have a copy in the params area. It would have a copy of the parameter for the system. So that's an important thing to understand. If you're trying to look at the plan and debug the plan and see how it's generated, uh, that's very easy to add in. And that's something that I would recommend you, you as you play with the system that you go ahead and do. And also before I destroy these machines, I do want to go in and show you the type of data that we collect on the system. So I've, I've sort of skimmed through really quickly the, the base operational controls. If I look at parameters, this is where we collect information. And this can be added to in a generic way. Uh, these are all named parameters, and you can see there's help and things like that for the named ones. If you want to just throw in random data, system allows for that. That's perfectly fine. And what you'll see is we know the information about who created it. We know a whole bunch of information about our cloud footprint, our zones, our cloud instance ID, the host name. So there's a lot of information you can build into your downstream automation. Uh, we do deep, deep inventory scans uh, for how the system is operating. We also have cost estimates, know the CPUs that are that are in the system, uh, considerable amount of inventory. We know how the machine was created. So uh, I'm showing you this because when you build downstream automation or when you build clusters, all of this information is available to you so that you can make good decisions about how to build and run the infrastructure. So at this point, we've, we've given you a general tour. We've completed all of the items in our uh, wizard to get things running. And now it's time to clean things up and say goodbye. So I'm going to go ahead and um, switch back into workflow mode. Allow me to delete uh, that infrastructure here. And now that I've done that, uh, oops, got to switch into workflow mode, allowing it to destroy the cluster. Uh, the machines here will be deprovisioned as we go. They should already be um, targeted. Let's see. There, we're in destroy. Cluster is being deprovisioned. The resource broker is doing the work. And that means that we can see these machines are all getting shut down automatically. So nice thing here is because we track all this information to connect it, as the clusters are deleted, the cleanup operations are going to automatically remove the associated resources, um, pull them out of digital rebar, and, and do the right behaviors. And that's a really important step because it means that as I'm working with clusters, I have full control. I can increase, decrease, or delete the clusters and provide some real auditability and infrastructure management along with that process. So I encourage you to always remember to do that. If you do this a lot, go ahead and set up those uh, cluster delete triggers so that you don't leave resources running that you didn't intend to leave running. So it's a lot of powerful ways, uh, even at the play stage, to take advantage of uh, advanced features in Digital Rebar. I hope this was helpful. Um, definitely a lot of information, but very, very easy to get running in Digital Rebar and have a simple and powerful experience doing cloud and infrastructure as code. If you have questions, please reach out and contact us. We are happy to help and walk you through uh, this process yourself and uh, talk about how you can bring this into your infrastructure and uh, improve your own processes. Thank you, and check us out at rackend.com.